Hi, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Wherever you find us, whether it's a video or podcast on your favorite platform, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. You can also find us on major social media platforms. If you go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, you can find links to the videos or MP3 files, which you can download and enjoy without commercial interruptions. If you're into classic horror, ghost, and adventure stories, I narrate Nightshade Diary, and you can find links at NightshadeDiary.com. If scary stories are your bag, and listening to encounters with cryptids, ghost, dogman, and other weird creatures sends a shiver up your spine, then go to SupernaturalStoryTime.com for links to our weekly podcasts. Noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird can be found at eerie.news or visit the Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Please subscribe to my newsletter on Substack. Just go to mppelliser.com for a link. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, how's everybody doing? Good? Everything's good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my, my uh, <laughs> according to progressive commercial, I'm going to talk about the weather and stuff like that <laughs> because everybody asks me. Yeah, you know, I'm always saying it's a hot. And then, okay, hold on. That's my timer going off. No, it's not one of my inopportune adult children that have perfect timing. No, it's not. That was a, a timer that went off. But anyway, um, you know, I checked the weather for obvious reasons, but all of a sudden I'm looking at something that says Arctic blast. I was like, are you kidding me? An Arctic blast? All right, why not? And sure enough, like tonight, it's supposed to be dropping like in the early morning hours, like into 69. Okay, now, it, it doesn't have itself. It's in the 90s during the daytime. And that's like, God, that's like a 20-something degree. But I'm okay. I'm not going to question it. I'm very happy because it cools down. You know, they're saying early fall weather. And I'm like, what? Okay. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, what is that saying about don't look a gift horse in the mouth? It's like an Arctic blast. Why not? Because, you know, of course, being in Florida, mostly, of course, I'm looking at the what's churning out there in the Atlantic. And luckily, the last one, I think, that was Ernesto, it just hooked up. And I think I think Bermuda was the one that had to worry about that. But that's fine. I'm, I'm happy with that. But, uh, yeah, one of those things, you know, as far as why I follow the weather, you know, and according to Progressive, I'm a responsible older adult, which could be, like, contagious to younger ones. I don't know, you know. I'll tell you this much, my adult children, they always call me up for stuff like that. I say, okay, all right. They must, they must think I know something, kind of. But yeah, that kind of deal. And uh, the thing with the pigeons, that's going good. I gotta give you, I gotta show you guys pictures later on of the of my babies, of my two girls, because I did get them both sex. They're both females. Which, by the way, I found out in pigeon world, pigeons usually lay two eggs, and the norm is male female male. F- there's only like a 5% chance of getting same-sex chicks um, from a hatch. So I'm going to take that as a good omen. Yeah, as a good omen. Because like I said, these are my foundation pigeons, which hopefully will produce famous racers that will win thousands and thousands of dollars for me and anybody I sell them to. Why not, right? And uh, again, yes, I am doing the Halloween live stream. And yes... I already opened up season 17 of Stories of the Supernatural, which, you know, uh, starts in January of next year, believe it or not, because here we're going down to the whole stretch of the year. I'm already getting that ready. So stay tuned for that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As Joel Brenner and the King of Siam would say. So let's get off to the good part. The good part is who is the guest today at Stories of the Supernatural? This is the first time she's here. Her name is Jill Remen Snyder. Okay, she... Uh, has been involved as I'm not sure if as a director and or producer of two Bigfoot documentaries. Um, and she has a YouTube channel entitled A Flash of Beauty Bigfoot Revealed and A Flash of Beauty Paranormal Bigfoot. Um, I'm going to put a link to her YouTube channel here in the credits of the show. But anyway, they're a uh, documentary um, where they basically, from what I understand, they they're going into the unsolved mysteries regarding Bigfoot or Sasquatch, all right? 
and everybody knows there's God, there's <laughs> we've been talking about this, just different ideas or theories as to what is Bigfoot. Is this an animal? Is this um how can I tell you? A uh, primate that an offshoot of a primate. Some people give it in a very elusive paranormal flavor to it where, yeah, it's for real, but it might also have some type of mystical aspects. And then, of course, we go into the theories of it being tied into ETs and even um, intra, if you want to call intradimensional travel or something along those lines as to why they appear and then disappear. But anyway, we're going to find out more about that. Help me welcome her. How are you doing today, Jill? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Let me ask you, how did you, I'm not going to say how you developed an interest in Bigfoot because I think a lot of people have, but what led you to do documentaries on that, on it? So what, what happened for me, um, well, first, first and foremost, Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, that's been a lifelong interest. Okay. And when I met uh, Brett Eichenberger, who's the director of the project, so this goes back over 20 years. When we met, one of our, one of our, the common denominator was, look, mm -hmm. I'm into this other stuff. Right. And he is like me too. What a relief! Um, that was one. Of, that was one of the one of the first questions. So do okay. you listen to Coast to Coast AM, and when we realized we had all the, the stuff in common, you know, right? We, we partnered up. So, so a Flash of Beauty Bigfoot revealed, and the sequel Flash of Beauty Paranormal Bigfoot was all kind of born out of um, when things came to a screeching halt back in 2020. Okay. Okay. You know, we are, uh, so I'm a producer and a screenwriter. Brett Eichenberger is the director, editor, uh, drone camera guy. Um, <laughs> and so we kind of balance each other out and we have a production company. This is our, we do video and film production full time. Okay. And, um, you know, we always talked about like, this was the dream project. Like okay. over the years, like, oh, can you imagine what it'd be like to do just, you know, just push away the corporate stuff and mm -hmm. do like a Bigfoot documentary or UFOs or, or ghosts. And uh, all of a sudden we had a lot of time on our hands. Isn't it funny how things happen? <laughs> I, you know, there was some choreography, there was some divine choreography in all this. Yeah. No joke. It was like an invisible hand kind of had things fall into place, but but yeah, you know, in June of 2020, we started production. And originally, we were, we were going to explore kind of the three silos, I say silos, of uh, the paranormal world. You have okay. your cryptids, you have your ghosts and hauntings, and then you have all your aerial stuff, the UFOs, mm -hmm. the aliens, abductions. And what we found out was, well, one, I'm just going to say it. I have so much respect for people who do UFO documentaries and who go out pursuing that because just staring at the sky all night, I, I just can't stay that focused. But there was something about being in the woods during mm -hmm. all this. And, uh, you know, originally, you know, we, we did an investigation on a cattle mutilation. We investigated a haunted hotel in Eastern Oregon. And we interviewed some people we knew in the Bigfoot community. Right. And it was really hard to line up. It just, there was a lot of obstacles. I just don't okay. think it was meant to be. And we kept getting redirected to more people who had Bigfoot experiences. And each person we talked to, they would introduce us to someone. And before we knew it, we were, we were on our way. Oh, well, let so, me tell you, sometimes isn't it unusual? Like you said, you know, you plan and you plan for the downtime and then, but at least that's great because you thought, okay, now that we're here, what are we going to do with this downtime? We're going to capitalize on it. We're going to have go fun. in that direction. We're going to have fun is what we're going to do. And it's been, yeah. you know, what, what's, what's the old quote? Um, you know, if you do what you love, you know, you never work. What was it? Follow, well, I know it's one of these new agey things. Uh, follow your passion. It's I know what you mean. The money will follow or something. I, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, this has been, these projects have been a gift. They really have. Yeah. And I mean that in the way that the people we've met, uh, mm -hmm. the, the things we've learned, the okay. amount of incredible like experiences, stories, uh, education 
that right. we've been exposed to has really like opened our eyes to other aspects of the paranormal world, mm -hmm. um, which I should make a little like footnote there. The paranormal is normal first and sure. foremost. Sure. Uh, but as far as understanding and being able to experience all these mysteries is because from what I, from what I've seen, I think you guys interview like regular people. And I say regular, you know what I'm talking about. People that might not have never told their stories to anybody or their unknowns. How's this? Yeah. yeah that's that, yeah, that they might've had one experience or several, but if it wasn't for you, nobody would ever know who they are or what happened to them. I personally think those those are the best stories. You know, when you speak to the person who, let's say they live, I'm gonna call it Bigfoot country or whatever, whatever the case might be. And they tell you the story and you're like looking at them and you're like, this person's telling me the truth. You know, they're not looking, you know, uh, uh, how's this? Um, they're not retelling a story maybe that you've heard a hundred times on, on, you know, these different paranormal or Bigfoot shows. And you can no, tell they're, they're reliving it. They yeah. Yes, exactly. It. And um, what we've noticed is when, you know, whether it's Bigfoot, whether it's um, a ghost encounter, whether it's mm -hmm. a UFO sighting, it's, it's almost therapeutic mm -hmm. when you can find yes. someone who will listen, yes. who is, will hold space for you and isn't going to pass a judgment or, you know, start start questioning yeah do that like that well, okay all right oh yeah. right yeah no it, it's almost like therapy for a lot, a lot it's of a catharsis people. for some people i've spoken to it's a catharsis because and i hate to say it and I've, my audience will know sometimes people feel better when they tell when i say a stranger somebody that's not a family friend or anybody like i gotta tell somebody i'm gonna tell you because you don't know who i am and you know you might not be like oh come on you know <laughs> something like that um, and especially, I want to say, especially if it's somebody who doesn't want to lose face, you know, maybe with their family or their friends, depending also what they do for a living, that they're going to be thought of, man, they're going to look at me like I'm weird now if I say, or if they have a reputation of being a no nonsense person and they're like, you had a what experience? Oh, come on. You know, they, they, they're still trying to hold on to that persona that they're known by. Mm -hmm. And then they, they have this story or stories. And it's like, well, you know what? I'm going to tell you. I'm sure, I, I'm sure. Haven't you ever uh, had an interview start off? Well, you know, I've never told anybody about this. <laughs> a lot of them. And, you know, some of the, some of the best interviews that I, I wouldn't even call them interviews. I, I'd say conversations right. are the ones that happen off camera. Mm -hmm. Those are always the best stories. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, going to conferences and talking to people, because usually we'll set up a little booth, you know, with our mm -hmm. information and people will come by and just kind of just, you know, like confess, it's like a confessional. Like I want, I want to share. And then it's, you can see them, like, it's almost like the mood shifts. They feel lighter mm -hmm. because they've been able to share this with someone who's not going to, you know, call them crazy sure. and whatnot. And, um, yeah, you know, and just to just to kind of circle back on the comment you made, how some people, you know, they just they're repeating the same story over and over, mm -hmm. um, or or some people are kind of out looking for their fame and fame and glory and whatnot. We've been really lucky in right. that respect. Um, you know, the people that we've interviewed, uh, I don't want to say that they've all been reluctant, you know, witnesses. Right, but they're like. You know, for a lot of these people, it's the first time they've gone on camera to talk about yes. it. And, yes. Uh, yes. and uh, yeah, we've just gotten really lucky in that respect. I, I, you, know? I, you know, many years ago, well, I haven't done it lately. I was a hypnotherapist and I had a few people come to me with having, because people don't realize, it depends on the personality. What having an experience like that does sometimes to people's head, for lack of a better word, their sanity sometimes. Mm -hmm. Not because they're going to run around, you know, pulling their hair out, but kind of their reality kind of goes on its side because they never believed maybe that this was real. So, you know, I, I have had, you know, long for a while, people that had come to me behind the scenes, and that's another whole story, wanting to be hypnotized, not to recover memory, but to bury it, which I couldn't do as a hypnotist. You really can't do it despite what people think hmm. about something they had seen, they had witnessed, which wigged them out so badly that they wanted to go. I want to go back to my life before I saw that. 
All right. They didn't. In other words, and I can't, you know, of course, everywhere you go, there you are. You can't outrun that memory. And like PTSD, you know, the memory is always very fresh. So the, I, I had, you know, a few clients, as a matter of fact, that usually came through other people and uh, that this, you could, what you were saying about this being real, this was true for them, that they were like, I can't come to grips with this because I don't know how to fit it into my world pre this experience. All right. Paradigm. And it depends also on the experience. Some people I know that depends on their, you know, you've heard of, well, Bigfoot's, you know, friendly or, you know, is, um, if you want to say part of nature, there's people have their, depends on their, their attitude towards it. But again, it's once you see it with your own eyes, something happens to you in your head, depending on the personality that you're like, okay. And if that's possible, what else? <laughs> that exactly. I think doesn't exist, does exist. And we've, we've heard that from so many people. Yeah. Uh, Rich Germo, uh, who we feature in both documentaries, he comes uh -huh. to mind because he said it uh, in the first documentary, I thought Bigfoot was a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. And, you know, former military, former law enforcement, no one prepared me yes. for this. So what else have I not been told about? Or what else has been kept right. secret and you start questioning everything. Yes. You know, but one of the things, one of the things we did in the first documentary is we featured a psychologist who's actually based in Florida. His practice is in Boca Raton. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Michael Adams uh, talked about how how the, the human mind deals with trauma and files things away. And what was really interesting is he talked about there could be a whole subset of people who've had Bigfoot encounters, but it's so repressed, they don't even know that they've had it. Right, right. And then, and like I said, it depends on the personality. I mean, I'm sure you've even heard, even with extraterrestrial and abductees, recovered memories, and you know, you have to be really careful with that. But yeah, I, I tell everybody, depending on your mind, if something is so stressful, that I'm going to say that your mind thinks that your sanity could not take it, you will repress it. And sometimes you never remember if you, you never, if you're this personality that it's going to forget it. And then sometimes it takes years. That's when you I'm sure you've heard of people that will start having weird dreams or flashbacks years later, because it's at that time that your mind thinks you're going to be able to handle this. You're going to, you're going to, you're not going to lose your sanity, but some people never get there, but yes, People do repress their memories if it's traumatic enough, all right? And trauma doesn't have to be, you know, everybody thinks of like PTSD as in wartime, or if you see a grisly accident, something like that is traumatic for a oh, normie. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Is. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and like you said, depending on what kind of encounter you have and what your yes. own, uh, your own understanding, um, yes. you know, I used to, I used to believe that, you know, the universe kind of meets you where you are. Mm -hmm. You know, and like, we're only going to give you as much as you can handle. Well, no, I have to rethink that one. But, um, but yeah, you know, we've, we've talked to people who've had these amazing, uh, you know, friendly encounters. They're just absolutely beautiful. We've had people who've had encounters where it scared them to death, yeah. even though Bigfoot wasn't necessarily doing anything, right. threatening, but because all of a sudden you realize there's like a nine foot apex predator in in the forest and sure. you and your gun out hunting are not going to be able to do anything and then of course the people who just have that that fleeting sighting like one yeah. running across the road or through the woods or just you know right something that in your mind you try to think no that wasn't a bear no that wasn't that that wasn't that that wasn't that and you're like oh crap you know you yourself you know you can't lie to yourself you know you come to the conclusion god was that a and many, um, a few years ago, I interviewed this gentleman. He's already passed away, Jim Smith. He used to run the Alabama Bigfoot Society since the 70s. And he would tell me he lived out like in a part of Alabama that was very rural. And he said that the people would have these sightings of Bigfoot going along these country roads. And they would call the police. What are the police going to do? They'd be like, okay. So he says that sometimes the cops would bring the people over to his house and they go, Hey Jim, we got somebody for you. And he told me, Marlene, he goes, I don't know what these people saw. I, 
He goes, but whatever it's they saw, they believed it. And he said he had a few that would say, sir, do you mind if we stay at your house till like daybreak? <laughs> like they, they were afraid to get back on the road and have another encounter. And like you said, it wasn't because Bigfoot attacked them. It was just that it was like, uh, oh my God, but that thing crossing the road or by the road. Um, and he, I mean, he had a bunch of stories along those lines where he says, you could tell these people were not lying and they were scared. They were really scared of what it, whatever it was that they saw. And he said, and of course, you know, like most people, when they call the police, the police is like, what do you want us to do? <laughs> Run after Bigfoot in the bush? No, we can't do that. And yeah, like those stories, there's a lot of them like that. Um, yeah. resources are limited you know the police no. can't run after every bigfoot call so no of course it's not, you know and it, and sometimes you know what i'm not gonna say I, a lot of people will see things that they think is bigfoot it's not bigfoot i'm not gonna say there's no mistaken identity i'm sure there is of course yeah but okay when you take those out of the way you still left with a lot of people seeing something directly or indirectly that that it's like okay so what is that? what's out there uh and i've also heard and i don't know if you've interviewed anybody that's done these recordings of what is supposed to be bigfoot chatters and one time i spoke to ron moorhead who's cuts <laughs> you know the only camping i've ever done is been like in a campground with like a you know one of these guards i mean i've never done this deep in the woods campground but i thought if i was out there and i heard this <laughs> I'd be like going to sleep in my truck or my car and booking it out of there in the morning. You could tell this was like, there's, I can't think of any animal that would make these type of calls. The, just, that audio, the Sierra sounds uh, unbelievable. Uh -huh. And we actually, we, uh, Brett and Mike, Mike Ferry, our yeah. cinematographer uh, and I, we went out to visit uh, the Omaha reservation. Okay. In Nebraska. And we, you know, we were waiting to go out that evening. We were around a fire and off, not too far off in the distance, we could hear, it, it sounded like, it sounded like uh, monkeys getting excited. Yes. It, that's yeah. what I can compare it to. And we all looked at each other and uh, the, the gentleman who was hosting us said, oh, they know, they know we're coming out. <laughs> yeah. And that night we were bluff charged. That's a whole other story. Really? But yeah, but uh, the Sierra sounds, we're actually currently working on a documentary based okay. on Ron Moorhead's recordings. Okay. In this, in the Sierra Nevada. Um, and let me tell you something that's that alone. I'd be what in the, and I'm not, by the way, I'm not an outdoors woman, outdoors, man, whatever you got, where, you know, these people will tell you, I know what all these weird calls are. This animal will make if it's mating. I'm not that type of person. But I think I know enough that you could tell this is this this is not like a wolf or a coyote or a buck or you know, especially at night. All right. Because you think, okay, there's certain animals that will come out at night that make these weird calls. And when you hear that, it's like like you said, it sounds like monkeys mm -hmm. chattering, except it's in the northwest somewhere. I mean, it's like but Well, yeah. you know what surprised us is that okay, so I'm I'm a native Oregonian. Okay. And so is the rest of our film crew. And we just kind of assumed foolishly that Bigfoot was only in the Pacific Northwest and up into Can like British Columbia. We thought it was kind of an isolated thing. Oh, no, we did not realize uh, Oklahoma, uh, yes. Texas, uh, New England, Ohio, yeah. um, the Midwest. Yeah, and Florida, of course, with the yeah, skunk, skunk cave. cave. We had no idea. So they're they're everywhere. And with the audio that uh, Ron recorded mm -hmm. up, in, uh, up in California, we consider that sort of the gold bar. Uh, that's like the gold standard of the audio to support the evidence of yes. Bigfoot. And so, so we have that. But then also, there's a bunch of other things that kind of come with, and I, I might be jumping the gun. So just tell me to slow right. down. If I, I, know, know, go ahead. But um, so it's like, we have the footprints, we have, uh, you know, the, the tree breaks and whatnot. We have, mm -hmm. you know, we have the audio. A lot of times during the interviews, we'd reach a certain point and people would look at us and ask, 
do you want me to tell you the weird stuff? And it'd be like, absolutely it's like that's what we're here for uh, yeah <laughs> or or uh, worse we would get done filming be packing up the cameras uh-huh. and then, oh yeah there's this other thing i forgot to mention so what we've found in doing all these interviews is there seems to be more often than not what you could say is a, a paranormal connection yes people are record reporting seeing orbs or ufos yes. uh uh, before, during, after their sighting, uh, they're they're experiencing the telepathy, the mind mm -hmm. speak. Uh, they're they're witnessing a ports and things appearing out of nowhere, disappearing. Also, mm -hmm. uh, haunting activity as well. Yes. Yes. Uh, one of the one of the witnesses we interviewed, Daryl Adams. He mm -hmm. had a, set, uh, a property in Central Oregon, Central Southern Oregon, that he and Tobe Johnson were made it their habituation and research spot. And okay. it was like a mini skinwalker ranch. Okay. I was going to go there because yes, they had a little bit of everything, uh, UFO mm -hmm. sightings on a pretty regular basis. And it just wasn't them. Everyone in this area was experiencing this. Um, Daryl was having the Bigfoot come down to his property interacting, leaving things. You know, one of the reports that we get that always, you know, I have to scratch my head is things appearing in places where they shouldn't. Yeah. A lot of times uh, Daryl will go out to his truck and, there'll, and it's locked and there'll be like a white feather laying on the console. Or uh, my favorite is when they lived at the property in Oregon, one day they came back from church and in the middle of their living room, there's this good size rock. I don't know where it came from. Neither like, like what, how did this happen? Right. Yeah. It's almost like kind of a show of force. Like, oh yeah, we can, we don't need a key. We, we can get yes. in on our own, yes. but um, all sorts of things like that. So, so in the sequel of Flash of Beauty, Paranormal Bigfoot, we brought in scientists and okay. we're like, how do we explain this? What's going on? And, to make a long scientific story short, it, it all comes down to quantum physics. It comes down mm -hmm. to science we don't understand. Sure. And um, and a lot of stuff that I am not well versed in speaking on. Right, right. And and some of these things you hear, you know, I mean, I've heard of, you know, of course, inter interdimensional travel, whether you want to call them porters or portals or rips, you know. Are they, can they come through a portal or are they coming in through a rip? You know, like, hey, it opens up and they, you know, scoot over, you know, is there pockets where they can go into interdimensional pockets? Well, you know, like, you know, where you could hide in this little pocket and then come out. Or I think also that they're masters of camouflage and yet they could be right in front of you and you just don't see them because they have the ability to stand or totally still. Because usually our human eye, especially if you're out in the woods, you, you usually you'll catch something when it moves. But mm -hmm. if some, and the reason I know is because I have farm animals and some of these like birds, like game birds, they'll just be like, you can't, you know, especially with a feather and you can't see them because they'll be like, they, they freeze. You can't see them. And I think they have that ability where they can freeze and you just, you know, you pass over them and you don't see them. You know, and, and, and I'm sure you've even heard that there's a version of, you remember from the movie, um predator the original one yes where it has like a blending camouflage kind of ability yes yes and it was like okay why not you know that's anything is possible as to what we're dealing with and like you said when you mentioned you know in, in the skinwalker thing that they had what they call that hitchhiker effect where people not not that they necessarily even had to be at the site they were going home and weird stuff st started happening at their houses. Yes. Which is like, okay, how does that work? You know, even people that weren't like, they said like people that were like running around doing security and that weren't really uh, engaged in the research in, in and of itself started experiencing things. When, by the way, some of it was kind of like weird, disturbing kind of stuff, like seeing some very unusual things. But uh, that, again, it makes you think there's more to them than just a... Uh, a lost creature that nobody's been able to find. There's like, like you said, some type of physics or something we don't understand. Yeah. And we, you know, we've heard 
we've heard, you know, a lot of theories and I come from the school of thought where until we know in absolutes, all theories are valid. Everything's on the table until we can, you know, use scientific method to eliminate and say, without a doubt, it's X, Y, and Z, not A through W. So, um, you know, and just like, and just like how, you know, some people say different regions have, uh, different temperaments and whatnot, Mm -hmm. they're just like people, you know, some are happy, some are friendly, some are grumpy, some are violent. And, um, I also think that has to do with, uh, the paranormal abilities, yes, so to speak. Um, we've, we've been told by people who do communicate with them that, you know, some some choose to live a more organic 3D life, okay. whereas others, because um, they have family units, and if the families kind of pass down mm-hmm. those abilities and make sure their children know about it, their right. Sasquatch yes. children, um, mm-hmm. that determines what you're dealing with. But something very interesting, you know, just kind of again, leapfrogging a little bit. In the sequel, uh, we interviewed uh, Eric Bard, okay. who is the lead you know, scientist at uh, Skinwalker Ranch. And we had mm-hmm. him, we had him uh, review some footage that was filmed by Barb Shoup, who is an okay. experiencer and a researcher. And it's, it's of a cloaked Bigfoot. And What's really interesting about that also is what she caught on camera, this kind of predator pixelated type thing. That isn't what she saw with her naked eye. What she saw was um, a black, a black kind of hairy creature with a conical head that took off running. And what the camera caught was something like bending and reflecting light. Right. Okay. uh, In that predator shimmery type of way. And he brought up a really good point that perhaps perhaps what we know as, and what we see with our eyes as Bigfoot is almost kind of like a, an avatar. Sure. For something else. Let me tell you something that's a deep rabbit hole, but very possible, very possible. As a matter of fact, and also when you said, and, and I wonder if anything, I was speaking to a gentleman, he's here from Florida and he does Bigfoot research. And I was talking to him and he's telling me how I want to say it was recent. I don't. I don't think it was too. He went in out here, and he said it was with his wife and his two two ladies. And he said that he had kind of that charging thing. And he says he goes, "I'm I'm an outdoorsman. I'm a hunter. I'm used to being out in the woods." And he says, "I had this feeling like I needed to like I was stepping on somebody's toes. Somebody wanted me other out of there." I'm looking at my wife and the other ladies, and they're like, "Nothing's happening." And we were talking about how much of this is it a male against male thing, like a testosterone thing going on, Good whether point. they're a mating season or territory. You know, it's like, I don't care about the women, but you're a man or male, you know, and I do have a problem with you. And he was like telling them like, you know, all right, you want to spend the night out here? Out here? He said he felt really uncomfortable being out there and he says and i could feel it whatever was there was watching us but they didn't feel any type of menace or like you know a stink guy kind of thing like we want you out of here it was just me and we talked about that he thinks that a lot of times these um occurrences where people will say hey i feel like we need to get out of there or that bluff charge it might be a male against male uh scenario you know, maybe you happen to stop by there when mating season's going on or there's a female close by. I mean, we don't really know, you know, are they solitary like bears that get together mate or do they travel around in pods or family units? Or, hey, let me tell you something. I want to say in, in, the, in nature, that's one of the most powerful things is the mating call. Let's face it, Errol. So maybe that's part of the, the thing of why they, they, in other words, they don't care if you're not the same species. You're close enough. <laughs> I mean, why not? Hey, I, mean, I don't know. Uh- <laughs> I, I mean, it's 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 a possibility, but that thing that you were saying as far as um, that what we're seeing versus what's there might be a totally different thing. Uh, yeah, think about that. that. Oh, man, that's a lot of people would be like, what? <laughs> that open, boy, that, that uh, 
that goes from a, a the friendly like little bunny slope jump into a hole like yes way, yes way way down the rabbit hole because but you know there's a lot of people that would resist that idea because they're very hung up on this image that we have of bigfoot mm -hmm. whether you know especially the people that are more friendly towards it i guess is what i'm saying as in know their nature you know and all of a sudden you find out that maybe what you thought was the hairy apish kind of lost primate deal is not exactly that wow yeah and then you get into i mean we touch on it slightly in the sequel, but then you get into you get into religion mm -hmm. and the implications of okay, let's uh, identify what Bigfoot Sasquatch is and what does that mean to our our history mm -hmm. and the DNA. You know, there have been DNA studies and whatnot, and it, it throws a wrench into what we've been we've been taught all these years. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's also you get into the whole idea of, you know, the extraterrestrial connection, of course, like, of course. you know, and we've heard multiple again, we've heard multiple theories and ideas behind all this. Some people some people believe there's also I don't know if race is the right word, um, a group. Right, right. It's it's a species. It's like I don't know, know what the classification. Um, yeah. But there, there's also uh, like engine, like bioengineering going yeah, on. Sure. Um, were they tweaked? TVs. Were they or, or were they totally uh, retweaked? <laughs> retweaked or, or or were they invented? How's that? Why why not? You know, right now, I mean, look what we can do with a CRISPR, but <laughs> but Ex which, exactly, you yeah. Know, yeah. Um, were they, are they off planet and were brought here and let's, ah, let's throw them and see what happens. Let's put them in the wilds. And, but then, you know, you hear these stories from, I understand, from, um, indigenous tribes, Native Americans that have talked about s something that sounds like a Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Yeah. It's a part of way before. History. Yeah. And, you know, we've, we've talked to enough tribal members, uh, mm -hmm. nationwide, Everyone has their own history right. and stories of the Sasquatch, the forest people. Um, right. And we're actually, we're getting ready to explore that further um, in our, in our next installment of a flash of beauty. Um, because I tell everybody when, um, and you hear this and, and it's like, it's really funny because you know, uh, Native Americans, you know, they would have sometimes these stories, you know, that mountain, don't go to that mountain, that forest, that river, because it's haunted or bad or whatever, or the, you know, like, leave it alone. Don't go there. That's the bad place. Don't go there. You know, and they, I think that's how they coexisted in a place where whatever was there is like, it's not, if we ignore it, it doesn't hurt us. But then people like us after we're like, oh, that mountain where you're not supposed to go, let's go there. You know? <laughs> What are you doing? Hello? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's right. let's find out what that's about. And I think the Native Americans are going, all right. <laughs> Case in point, like Skinwalker Ranch is this, you know, that that had the name of it was because supposedly this was where, you know, the Skinwalkers, according to Navajo tradition and all. In other words, that it was a place like, man, stay away from that place. You know, the Ute tribes and everybody around there was like, mm, go and around, take the, takes a long right. road, but don't right. go through there. Right, you know, and and you know we've had people going out there now trying to study it for what the last like seriously for like the last thirty years, but um, I you know I'm I, I still like, and and getting back to what you were talking about genetic you know, genetics that I know there's I can't remember that I think I don't know if you've heard of him I think he's an English geneticist, that he said I will be willing to test any genetic material that somebody will send me. Like in other words, he says, I don't believe in Bigfoot, but I'm not willing to just discount it. And I'm willing to test any samples. Let's say somebody finds in, let's say the Northwest. And I saw him a couple of times and then he faded. And at this point, and I, and I don't want to be a cynic, but I wonder that if anybody ever did find any hair or anything, if it, it wasn't contaminated, if they would actually fess up and say the truth, what do you think? Um, I think, I think people have tried to tell the truth and I, I don't think the masses are ready yeah. for that. Um, and again, I, I'm not well enough versed on all mm -hmm. the results 
on all the DNA testing that are still right. ongoing. People are still right. sending in uh, hair samples and whatnot. Right. But what they're finding is, oh gosh, how do we do this? I, it's a common mother, but the father is, it doesn't line up with, with normal DNA. Right. There's something in the chromosome. I, I, you know, I'm and it's and I know DNA not. has made a lot of advances <laughs> as far as that they get down to the smallest denominator as far as tracing. Yeah, and it gets into it, this gets into like in Ron Moorhead's book, The Quantum Bigfoot, mm -hmm. where he talks about um, D, uh, gene manipulation, uh, DNA manipulation yes. um, from off planet uh, extraterrestrials, mm -hmm. and but with us. And that the the Sasquatch are the original people, citizens who've been here the longest, and right. we're the ones that have been uh, tinkered with. Um, and yeah. that's a whole, that's a whole other show. That's a whole other rabbit hole. Yeah. Yes. Of course. Like who was here <laughs> first? Like yeah. And that you know maybe we were the ones that were dropped off. <laughs> you know, and it's like hey, let's 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 drop off these human things and let's see what happens with them. But you know, I'll tell you something funny about uh, about the the hair that people collect. Uh -huh. uh, you know, Mel Scahan talks about you know there's consequences. You know, if you take the hair from any of these sites and like keep them as trophies and whatnot. And on our website, on our YouTube channel, uh, mm -hmm. Mel Scahan has his full interview is up, and he okay. goes to great detail about what happened to him in his experience after he collected some hair. What happened? But, well, sometimes when you take things that don't belong to you, the original owner will come back looking for them in very dramatic fashion. Oh. I will leave it at that because it was it's my one of my favorite stories that we've heard okay. as far as experiences and I would not do it justice trying to trying to do that. It I've I never heard of that, but that is very interesting because, yes, that 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 there's some you know you even hear these stories. I'm I'm sure there's a couple of ghost towns out west where they say that people take maybe even a stone or some little artifact, and then they start sending the stuff back because they say a bunch of bad things happened after they took it. And I'll have park rangers say, yeah, we all the time we get people sending stuff back to us saying, hey, after I took whatever. And it says it doesn't have to be anything valuable per se. Oh my isn't God. it just a, is Bodhi, it general, Bodhi is one of them. Yeah, Bodhi's one yeah, of them. Yeah, it's a general like uh, the law, one of these laws of nature is if you're going to take something, leave something. Yes, yeah, an exchange. Yeah, it has an to exchange. be an exchange. Well, Daryl Adams had collected some, some Sasquatch hair. Uh, mm -hmm. what he believes is, and I do too, based on some weird happenings that started happening in our house. But uh, we were given the hair. It was sealed up in an envelope. We opened okay. it. I remember at one point we opened it to get a good look at it. We took it out carefully with tweezers and we filmed it with macro lens okay. uh, for the, for the sequel. Cause we, okay. Errol's talking about the hair and we wanted to show like, this is what it looks like close up. And we put it back in the envelope, resealed it, tucked it away in a safe place. Now, si like at the same time, Tobe Johnson, who we feature in both documentaries, uh, he has a glass vial that has a hair in it as well that he'll okay. take and he'll show it to people like, well, we think this is Sasquatch hair. So fast forward, we're all going about our lives. Uh, we had someone in our house that was kind of like, oh, come on, you don't really believe this, right? Right, right. And we're like, no, we have a hair. And they're kind of laughing like, okay, let me see this. We open the envelope, it's not there. Oh. We're freaking out because we're like, did we lose it? Did we lose our Sasquatch hair? Yeah. Right. And no, no. I, I... We're looking in the seams of the envelope. We have a high powered yeah. flashlight looking. And we're just like, that's so weird. And then, you know, it's kind of, you know, set it aside. Around that same time, like a day or two later, we mentioned it to Tobe. And Tobe just kind of looked at us and said, the hair in my glass vial went missing recently. Whoa. And it only <laughs> re it didn't reappeared later. So and in other words, it's like 
Uh -huh. We went back and it was in the envelope. What? They're plain as day. Yeah. Oh, man. I you mean, must have, you, I'm sure. Thank God. You know, if that happens when you're by yourself, you can say, I'm losing it. But you were, there was more than one person involved in this. Mm hmm. Where you're thinking, you didn't see it and I didn't see it. And now it's back? Yeah. Yeah. And we've had, I mean, we've had other like strange strange circumstances where synchronicities happen as well right um the occasional orb floating through okay. the house and whatnot and this kind of weird sounds and things you know certain appliances and electronics having really? a mind of their own yes during yes. certain conversations so really like the timing is like that's perfect timing yeah like if you yeah, uh-huh because, you yeah. know, you hear about that even from the paranormal, whether it's Bigfoot or anything. I call it the, the paranormal umbrella, but, you know, electronics sometimes, I'm not going to say sometimes electronics will act up. It has nothing to do with the paranormal, but sometimes the timing on it, like you said, when certain conversations, I mean, I've had shows that I call it paranormal sabotage, <laughs> stuff that's worked perfectly all of a sudden goes, Boom. and it's because certain, either a certain guest or a certain topic comes up. And after a while, he realized, okay, oh, oh, it's that topic. Okay, you know, somebody doesn't want, but I understand perfectly what you're saying as far as, the, and I don't know why electronics are so, I don't know, sense, um, why it I is sensitive. I guess the electromagnetic, the electromagnetics, um, and I think you know, the same thing that uh, ghost hunters experience, you mm -hmm. know, with batteries draining and like glitches and whatnot. Yes, Bigfoot researchers are getting that out in the field too. And the same thing with people like investigating um, like crop circles and everything. Yes. We've had that where we've gone out into the woods and all of a sudden, oh, all of our batteries are dead. Oh, that, okay. that gentleman that I was talking about, Tim Turner, out here in Florida, he's gone out to some places where, you know, in Skinwalker ha ha Ranch, they get that 1.6 megahertz reading. Yeah. Whenever there's going to be a, he says, I'm, he says, I'm in the middle of nowhere. You know, and he understands, and I'll start getting that 1.6 megahertz reading. And, you know, and anomalous stuff happens. And then we, you know, we could go into like, are we talking about, is this the, uh, how can I tell you, the announcement of a portal opening? Is that what it, you know, like, what is it? Is that something that we can't see, but, or our eyes can't see it, but that's basically the, and 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 then I tell everybody because I've I've done paranormal research since the '90s and I've been at places. My experience, when something really truly is going to happen, you you will feel it announce itself where you're at. You, there's I don't know how to describe it, and I'm not talking yeah. about equipment because you know and everybody's now got all these gadgets. Yeah, but if you really know how to, your body is like the best instrument in my. And and I say I'm most sure of these things will announce themselves. Change. They will announce themselves. Yeah. All Absolutely. right. Absolutely. Something there's a shift that. Maybe it's a compendium of things and maybe that 1.6 megahertz or other things are, it's like, this is the announcement that something is either coming through, opening, leaving. Um, the electronic, I think also is a sign of, I don't know. I don't want to say if it's either on purpose or just so happens because something's around or if it's using that energy, is it sucking that energy? And using that energy to manifest, yeah, you know it's the hard. Well, that that's just always the theory. I mean, there's the, the uh, there's a sabotage version where they say which it's it's on purpose. They don't want you to talk about something, or maybe it's just using that juice to manifest, you know, into this dimension. If we want, if, you know, we're gonna go into the inter interdimensional. Maybe being in this dimension is how's this is heavier. I don't know. I'm making. I'm, I'm sure there's supposed to be physicists going, going. What is she talking about? But that well, maybe it's denser, the, yeah, no, denser, it's, heavier. It's, yeah. Um, that maybe to even be here a little bit just pulls. You need to pull something, depending, I guess, on what you're made up of, whatever. But uh, yeah, that's that's so in the, across the board. You know, ETs, UFOs, paranormal, cryptids. And if I can, if I can recommend a book, Dr. Yes. Simeon Hine has a book called Dark Matter Monsters. Oh. And he gets into he gets into the physics and the science uh -huh. that explains explains uh, you know some of these paranormal abilities. A big write this down. Um, and it applies to 
what what people experience with ghosts, what people experience mm-hmm. with uh, UFOs, crop circles. Yes. Just, and it's a really easy read. That's the other thing. He he made it very user friendly, so it's not like uh, he's you'd be like about, he's talking about like MIT type, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, like all right, okay. And I'm like, oh, this makes sense. So yes. I I recommend it to everyone. Let me tell you something. The the um and and um t- talking real we're gonna go you know i'm sure you've heard of the stern colliders and other colliders that are out yes. there because there's also other stuff besides the one in switzerland that sometimes i think that's what worries people that they're gonna do something with dark matter or a hole or a wormhole or something and and it makes you wonder if this is really what's behind all of this stuff as far as the dark matter and the wormholes and or something that we can't comprehend or that doesn't belong here How's this? Or what's know. already going on? What has already happened that yes. we just don't we just don't know yet, or we're of not sure of? Because we're I so know, we, I, I, it's like I've, we're looking at our phones. We're you know. Oh no, this on it's the like computer. <laughs> no, I'm. Oh no, let me tell you something. I tell everybody. I you know what's about it. I was kind of like a one of these like oh I, I've never been like a conspiracy theorist cynic kind of person. You know like oh. I, I think until the last few years, but now it all of a sudden is like, is my phone listening to me? You know, that kind of, not that there's anything interesting because I don't talk about anything interesting, but still it's like after a while, you're like, huh? You know, <laughs> or the, it got to the point I, I laugh because people don't want to admit to it. But, you know, I have one of these cameras that I hang off my monitor and I finally got one of these little swivel things that you could put over the top of it, the camera. So, it, and I was like, just in case, you know, <laughs> just that's in case. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's, I think because, I, you know, when you live long enough, you know, I think technology has sped up so quickly that I agree with you. I think that we're just given the tip of the iceberg of what's been engineered, uh, discovered, used, developed. But I think that there's a lot more out there as far as, and of course we get into the area of the UFOs. Everybody thinks UFO, extraterrestrial. How much of these UFOs are not extraterrestrial? They're terrestrial, terrestrial, as in our stuff. Just that people are not used to seeing the silhouette man-made of something that you see going over your town or wherever. And everybody's thinking, oh, it's E.T. And I know it's not E.T. You know, it could be here, you know, Earth origin. You know, we just have never been privy to that we've gone that far you know and most people i don't i i think i think most people it just wouldn't really impact their day-to-day lives oh no of course not so i mean at at first you know and diane stocking says this in a flash of beauty bigfoot revealed you know what would happen if Mm -hmm. if the big discovery was made how would it change things and she's like unfortunately i i think Everyone would be really excited at first, but the majority of people, it would not impact their lives. They just go about their business. Right. Um, And I also, I mean, if you look at the way disclosure for UFOs, UAPs, whatnot Mm -hmm. has been, the way they've been rolling that out, like 10, 15 years ago, if on national news they had put out like these Tic Tac videos and whatnot, I think people would lose their mind, but nowadays it's like, ah, yeah, the the military government, they know about it. Meh. Yeah. What what else is on TV? Right. Like, oh, oh, yeah, for sure. Well, it could be one of two things. It could be like you said, people are like, hey, no, man. Yeah. You know, hey, that's so-and-so it's coming on Netflix. Okay. Yeah. There's an, okay, well, either that or people don't believe it. You know, they're kind of like, you know, when uh, Orson Welles did that, uh, that pretend you know, UFO, I mean, extraterrestrial invasion that people are running around, like basically lost it. We're a whole totally different type of people from them, from the people that lived back then that really believed that they were getting invaded. You know, now, like you said, most people would be like, and then there's, you know, I I, I, I think that uh, we've been conditioned by Hollywood, you know, the movies we've seen from whether it's uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind I want to say that's one of the earliest ones that I can remember that really looked at it. Um, Probably the best one, actually. Yeah. yeah, That applies to Bigfoot, too. Uh, 
just the whole, just what the, those witnesses went through and yes. how it, they couldn't get, they, it shifted their paradigm so much. Look at how it impacted their lives. They had to have answers. Yes. You know? Yes. And then the, um, uh, the other day I've been watching the X-Files. I hadn't seen the X-Files in a really long time. All right. After a while, you know, when you see it, when you see it on a weekly basis, which was many years ago, but when you see it close together and you see the storyline about the ETs and the agenda and everything, I was like, no wonder so many people believe this. Look at what these people are coming up with, which is, you know, behind the scenes collusion with ETs. But then at the same time, I was like, wow, this is great. Um, and I'm thinking how much of that has seeped into our collective subconscious that, like you said, either we kind of partially believe it or we wouldn't be that surprised. Like, you know, what, they started having hearings a couple of years ago that people are like, eh, meh, all right, okay. I mean, I, I remember I remember being a kid and that TV show V came out. Yes, yes. And they were like ripping off their faces and they were the, reptilians. And the lizard people, eating, yeah. Eating mice and whatnot. And I thought, well, this is really, this is odd. Why would... How creative I get. Like as a kid, I was yes. like, oh, this is very, this isn't like Star Trek or Star Wars. This mm -hmm. feels very <laughs> tied into what life would be like on Earth if this happened. Um, and now you hear, I mean, you hear. Well, they, they, um, I was reading this article. God, I can't Marlene right now. Remember, they were saying, you know, everybody always thinks of an invasion from ET. If, let's say we're talking here, um, aggressive or you know takeover kind of scenario where you know you think they're going to come and they're going to says all they have to do is since we're always going out there and we're putting out all they have to do is send us a message and go hey open this up and we will send you a the cure for cancer like just down we've, we're giving you these hundred um uh hundred book uh medical solutions and they all we have to do is download it just like a virus and it could take down uh, everything, you know. They go, ET doesn't have to come in with a bunch of ships. All they have to do is send us the equivalent of a virus. Uh, they say they, they could do the same thing, um, you know, as far as disabling us, that they really don't need, uh, like, all these armies to come and take us down. Because remember, we're going out there going, hey, hey, <laughs> you know, I hello. think we're already here. I think yeah. they're already here and yes. they're comfortable and I mean, do you think you know, that they're ETs or do you think they're hybrids? Uh, maybe both. Okay. Maybe that again, that's a whole other rabbit hole that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I know, you'll get people I know that just will... enough to be dangerous about. So, <laughs> right. You know, the, and, you know, you get these things where they've been trying to hybridize us, hybridize us for, but, only the ones that were like very, very human-like, in other words, that could pass off as true humans are let go into the population. Uh, like there's there's a variant. Some of them is like, no, you can't go to Earth, man, or we can't let you loose. Don't know right away. <laughs> You're an ET. No, you, oh no, you, you know, we, we got the right mix with you. You could pass off as a regular human. And a those couple are the years ones ago at the McMenville uh, UFO Festival, it's uh -huh. like, it's, amazing uh if you ever have a chance to get out to mcminnville oregon it's usually okay, okay. but huge parade uh, they bring in you know all these famous speakers and whatnot and a woman came up to me i was kind of like oh wow this is all so cool and fun and a woman came up to me and just said you know they're here they they come to these events where they can blend in and and kind of like take it all in. They, they just get a kick out of this. And then she proceeded to tell them, I was there, uh, I had a booth for Bigfoot stuff. Right. Um, but then she just proceeded to talk about how going up and down Interstate 5, uh, like through, through Oregon, California, Oregon, up into Washington, it's almost like an express lane really? for UFOs. And she's like, oh yeah, they're traveling up and down all the time. And, you know, sometimes when you see the, the fighter jet scrambling usually like uh -huh. once a week they'll they'll just kind of be out doing their their weekly their you know cruise and uh she's like yeah but sometimes when there's a there's a lot more activity and they're moving uh -huh. in areas that they shouldn't yes. be 
is usually because there are there are sightings going on. And it's funny because at the beginning of our documentary, when we started this, we we investigated a cattle mutilation in mm -hmm. eastern or like southeast Oregon. Okay. And you know, we at the end we were asking the rancher and the ranch hand, we're like, well, what do you think you know, what do you think happened? You know, who who could have done this? Okay. And they were convinced it was Satanists who went out there. And I'm like, no Satanist is driving their car like 10 extra miles off this dirt road. Let me ask something. Was it the the the, the mutilations that you usually hear about, like uh, the, that surgical precision kind of deal? Is that surgical how they mutilated? Surgical precision, no blood. Uh, the okay. farm hand, when he was handling the cow he got violently ill for a couple days really see yeah that? i think it's so interesting and uh none of the animals would ever go around it yes. and uh you know there's a lot of birds of prey and like mm -hmm. coyotes and stuff they wouldn't touch it because they're saying usually if an animal goes down it is cleaned up oh but yes yes no one would touch it it just kind of de it just kind of yeah everybody itself. gives it all the predators all the scavengers nobody touches it it's like well yeah. here's the thing is they told us after they they gave us their theories on why it would be satanist because mm -hmm. who else would do it they started talking about they're like you know in this little valley we're always seeing like weird lights in the sky and stuff and the military is always flying through here and whatnot well, just so happened, I spoke to a gentleman. His name is Dr. Rapuano. And we were talking about, he, he, ha, he has a book out <clears throat> about ET encounters. He's, uh, he's, who works a lot with the brain. He's, he's, you know, brain and uh, that's his specialty and everything. And I got into the subject is like, how many cows are they going to kill? And we were talking, he tells me that uh, bovine brains is like one of the best materials for research. I was like, what? I never knew that. Because I was thinking, like, how many cows are you going to kill? Just what? To study them what? And he's telling me how the bovine brain uh, material is used in research. Because I guess um, whether it is to grow, um, sam whatever it is that you're trying to grow or develop, this is like the perfect, I guess, I'm going to say nutrient. I'm not, I'm not sure if that, but it's like the perfect uh, template hmm. for using it. And I was like, well... Now that changes it, you know, if bovine brain, cow brain is, is, can be used in the lab to grow whatever it is that you're trying to grow. Now, maybe that, I don't know why they would take the udders and, you know, all the other stuff and the, you know, all the stuff that you hear about. But as far as the brain, that was like, I go, well, and maybe they're using the blood for something else. I'd never heard of that. Uh, so because again, the mutilations, they're almost the same, no matter what part of the country you're at, same thing. And I've even heard some ranchers like down in Texas and all these areas, this is at this point, they're so, not that they're used to it, but they're like, this is the cost of doing business. That they know that they're going to lose X amount wow. of cattle and that they've I even had researchers say, and they're like, we can't figure it out. You know, same thing. Predators, scavengers, give it a wide berth. Do not get near it. I know in some cases they've taken tissue samples to see is there is it diseased? No, the you know, it didn't die because it was sick. Uh there was one in um oh Marlene, I want to say was it Missouri, where they did take some tissue samples and they found um barbiturates in it. And I was like, hmm. Okay, barbiturates. I mean, are they drugging these animals? I'm not talking about Satanists. I'm talking about maybe ETs. I mean, like, yeah. it, are they yeah. drugging them? And we, and is it they're not finding barbiturates because they're not testing for it? Are they just testing for whatever makes a cow sick or, you know, some type of disease, but they're not really testing it for drugs? I don't know. Yeah, like that, that's an weird. interesting point. You know, one of the things that really stood out that, you know, you hear that like, oh, there was no blood. The farmhand, he was also like he he was a butcher or he took butchery classes, you know. OK. For, and he was like, you have he's like, you don't understand how much blood is in an adult cow. 
He's like, this oh. whole area should have been saturated. Right. Based on the incisions and whatnot and cuts on it. He's like, there was not a drop. And that's, I think that it's almost like that you would think, I mean, is it that they're draining it there or is it being killed somewhere else and then it's being brought over there? I mean, it's like, how does that work? I have no idea. I can, and it's like, you know, I mean, I we can could get barely into wrap my head around these, you know, cryptids walking amongst us. <laughs> right. You know, and, and, and I hate to say it, but when you look at the cattle mutilations, it gives it a sinister kind of like feeling. Because yeah. nobody wants to think like, what are you doing to an animal? And why are you ensanguinating it? And what are you doing with the udders and the tongue and the brain? Like, that's kind of like, like what? And as, as a matter of fact, butchers will say that what's taken is of the whole animal. That's the most expendable. That's the least expensive part that a lot of butchers, you know, they sell for nothing or just throw it away. They take the utter, the, the anus, the, all these parts that are like, like, in other words, it's not like, Hey, they're, they want to have a steak for dinner or something. <laughs> Maybe it's they're, a courtesy. It's a courtesy that they are only taking what they, they view as the less uh, desirable parts. Yes. Well, yeah, we could look at it that way <laughs> unless they're growing. I mean, I mean, we could, that, that, that's a whole, you know, maybe they've got this lab where they're using all these parts of the cow to, to grow who God knows. Uh, yeah. I mean, and again, we always come down to even with, whether it's Bigfoot, that question, are they friendly? Are they unfriendly? Or are they just indifferent? And everybody has their own version of how do they, whether it's even Bigfoot, you know, you'll, I'm sure you've heard of people that think of Bigfoot like, yeah, you got to be careful with Bigfoot because, you know, all those people disappearing in national parks, they were, <laughs> they were done in by a Bigfoot. We've heard that too. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's a valid, that's a valid point. Yeah. I think that, you know, I, I think more than I'm letting on, but well, no, I, you know what? For another documentary. <laughs> well, do you know what you like you were saying, you know, how different parts of the country have their version of or even the different name for like a Bigfoot Sasquatch type creature. You, you'll hear some of them are friendlier and then there's others that are known to be like very aggressive. All right. Um, and, you know, maybe or may, I tell everybody, you know, when an animal, depending gets old and or sick it will usually go after prey that it normally wouldn't because it's hungry you know it needs to eat all right um that might account for it also you know it's like ah oh, man that i normally That's don't great. go for okay. humans but i'm hungry and anything as big as a bigfoot has must have a very high caloric intake it has to have if it's that big and i'm sorry berries are not gonna cut it all right. No, they're following the deer migration. They're, yes. they're following the salmon runs. Yes. Um, and, you know, there's reports of them in like suburban areas getting into trash cans, almost like. Yes. And that's that's the thing that I'm thinking animals. about. Animals. Um, but, you know, when when you're hungry, you're you're going to yeah. look for the, the path of least resistance. So, well, people don't think, you know, you could be Bigfoot and maybe you could take a fall and sprain your ankle. That's just me. But it happens. Animals, it happens to animals, you know, out in the wild, you know, you'll find uh, deers, you know, their antlers become entangled. You know, there's, they found like, you know, carcasses or things where they found, fell in a hole because everybody thinks that animals are so unknowledgeable in the wild that nothing like that ever happens to them. I think that Bigfoot could suffer an accident and before maybe he could run after that deer, but not anymore. So I guess I'm just going to go through so-and-so's trash can or that guy that comes out here by himself <laughs> that's up in that blind and I'm really hungry. <laughs> He's looking like a, a good He's like, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I, I think that, that there's always a possibility. I mean, like poor, poor Bigfoot. He must be like, but yeah, I, um, have you had any, um, of the people that you've interviewed that have come across or cited, uh, something like a dog man? Yes, we have. Um, let me rack my brain here. I do know that, let's see here, Jeff Roan, who we feature in the first documentary, he's had a dog man encounter. 
Okay. Uh, not too far from, I think where he is having Bigfoot activity. Um, let me think this, cause we've talked to a lot of people. Um, we have, I mean, we've, we have talked to a lot of people who have had dog man, um, encounters or what they suspect were mm -hmm. actually, actually, um, Harold and Cody, who we feature as the very last story in a flash okay. of beauty, paranormal Bigfoot. After we filmed their interview a few days later, uh, Harold called us and said that, uh, there was a forest, a forestry person, you mm -hmm. know, doing, you know, marking trees, timber work, timber cruiser. And, okay. uh, she came up on something that was about eight or nine feet tall. It was turned around from her. She thought, she thought it was Bigfoot. Okay. It turned around and it had a wolf face. Oh. And after she's having this, like, this is not a bear. I am seeing this. This is really happening. Uh huh. This thing with a, like a werewolf type thing going right. on. It disappeared. It Holy just crap. dematerialized in front of her. And so she went to the local, um, and she got out, she took off, but she went to like the local, uh, like bait store kind of out there in the country, right. went in shaking, just like I, I, this thing just happened. I, I just saw this thing and everyone's just kind of looking at her like, right. Oh, but, um, but yeah, they're, but nobody, I, but see, and that's the kind of thing that sometimes people just want to like, I need to tell somebody like, and I think that's even, how's this? Because I think again, because going back to the Patterson film and everything, we've, we're kind of like, yeah, Bigfoot, Bigfoot. But if you see something along the lines of that looks like a werewolf, you're like, uh, -huh. <laughs> you know, oh, I, this thing is going to eat me. It could outrun me. It could kill me. Like, how do I get out of here? Yeah. Uh, this is and like, this is an apex predator kind of deal. Oh, I'd say apex and then some. And then some, uh, yes. The reports we have heard and like the stories and encounters that I've heard from other people are, that's next level stuff, you know, and originally when we were going to do all these different kind of, you know, paranormal things for the original documentary, I mentioned to Brett, oh, and we can, we can do, we can go talk to this person about dog man. And there's a dog man sighting over here. Brett just looked at me. He's like, who's dog man? He thought it was, uh, yes. Is like, you know, some, some like, researcher's code name or something. I was like, <laughs> I was like, Brett, dog man is, and I was trying to explain like, well, right. people have had werewolf sightings and there's these like dog soldier type, you know, yeah. sightings, blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me and said, Jill, let's try to get people, you know, on the same page as far as, you know, believing that Bigfoot is real. And once we do that, then we can move on and talk Let me about this. As a matter of fact, that movie Dog Soldiers is a pretty good descriptor of what people describe as dog soldiers. I mean, yeah. as a dog man. Yes, yes. And uh, I tell everybody this. I'm going to go real quick. Back in the early 2000s, since I was doing paranormal stuff, I would always have these weird emails, people sending me emails. And I, I had, I, I assumed it sounded like a young guy. He sends me an email. That's the same thing that we talked about. Like, I need to get this off my chest. And he didn't say... I'm going to assume it sounded like some type of Midwest state he had gone hunting. And I'm doing, by the way, the, the, the condensed version of the story where he goes out with his father and a group of men, I guess they're all hunting. Some of them see something that later on, he, he, he doesn't know what it is. He all of a sudden his father says, we're leaving. He says, he sees them talk and his dad and he says, man, I knew my dad when he was scared, he'd get mad. And he just told him, throw yourself in the truck. We're leaving. And he's like, well, what? He's like, what? What do you mean? Get it. We're leaving. Okay, fast forward a few days. This is in the email. He apparently, he's one of the first to get home after school. And he says how, he says, I, I usually will go to the kitchen to get something to eat. And I hear something upstairs, like a creak, like somebody's upstairs. And he's thinking, that's weird. Who's going to be upstairs? Like, So he, he kind of described where his stairs did like up and then they switch back, you know, to the hallway upstairs. And he says he comes up on this landing and 
you know, I guess the I, I'm thinking the land the way I imagine the landing, you can kind of like look down the hallway. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then but he says by he says that all of a sudden he's also like a growling, and he's thinking that's weird. He says because we kept our dogs outside, the dogs weren't allowed, like they weren't inside the house. So he's like growling, but he says he comes up to the landing. All of a sudden he looks down the hallway. He says he described he didn't call it a dog man, by the way. When he sent me that email, which was just early 2000s, it wasn't a dog man. He didn't say dog man. He said it's something. He looked like a werewolf, like a big giant werewolf thing. And he and it was standing in that you said that about that a port. I was that's what came to mind when. And he says that he just saw this and he didn't finish going up the stairs. He says he like jumped over like the banister of the stairs and he said he ran to his grandparents' house. So I'm I'm assuming that his grandparents were like close by. He says that. Finally, it took him a while. He comes around and he tells his dad about it. He says, oh, he goes, after that, I never came home before somebody was home with me. He goes, like, in other words, I would go to a friend's house. I would go to my grandparents' house. I never came home to be by myself until everybody else was there. So he says a little while after that, he talks to his dad and he tells his dad, hey, what, why, what, why did we leave that day so suddenly on that hunting trip? And he goes, well, no, there was one of the guys who had gone out. I guess they were getting ready to go, I don't know, putting up a blind. I don't know what he was doing. Sees what he describes again. He said like a werewolf. And he says, again, doesn't use the verbiage of a dog man out there. And the guy was totally shaken up, comes back and talks to them. And they call another guy over. And this other man was familiar with the area. He says, look, I've never seen that, but I have heard of people in this area, outdoorsmen, seeing what he described. I think we should all leave, you know? And his father told him, and by the way, the guy that says that saw him, he goes, I know that man. And he would, he just, he's not a liar. He would not lie. So then he tells his dad what happened. And his father gets all upset and goes like, oh, and he says that right after he sees that, he says that in that area. So I'm going to assume it was rural. People started losing like livestock and chickens and, but then it just died away. It stopped. And his father was like, why didn't you tell me that? And he said, the further same reason you didn't tell me your story when back then, like, you know, it, it wasn't like a long time afterwards that him and his father had that conversation. And again, it's what you were talking about. It, they, the, the, that uh, dog man word wasn't used, you know, but it and it, in the email, it was I think I want I want to say it's the same thing what you described where people I got to tell somebody about this. All right. And since you're doing the paranormal, you probably hear a lot of weird stuff. Back then, when I read the story in the email, I was like, wow. And I just put that email away. It was like, I didn't, I hadn't heard really about dogmen, nothing like that. I was like, wow, that's a way out story there. Okay. But why not? You know, it wouldn't be the first time I'd heard weird stuff. And uh, then fast forward as the years have gone by and this thing of dogman has come into the lexicon of people having the sightings. I'm thinking, wait a minute. This sounds like what this kid saw years back and the, the one part that i and i've heard this afterwards from other people that it was at his house and i have heard of people who have had dogman sightings where somehow or other this thing ends up coming into the area where they live at and it's like how does that work you know how, how does you know and then that's that's where it gets kind of fuzzy on the edges as to how that happens yeah how did the dog man get in his house i mean it was like a lot of people talk about being tagged you know and having these yes. things follow them home like an imprint um, yeah uh, you know there's a gentleman in louisiana who's a who's an experiencer and researcher by the name of scott pace and he's he has a, a fantastic uh not bigfoot dog man uh, experience that kind of unfolded at the same time. Okay. Um, and if you can, I know he, his interview is out there, but, um, okay. But we wanted, we wanted to feature him in our, in our sequel, but we just weren't able to get out to Louisiana. Uh, oh, he's down in Louisiana. From Oregon. Yeah. But okay. he has a, he has quite the story and the story continued at home. Yes. 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 That's a, This is what I find like, that's like, okay, besides the fact that you see something that you only think is in the movies, the next thing you know, this thing is like, knows where you live. How's that? <laughs> Talk about something to worry about. It knows where you live. 
Um, Jill, it's been wonderful to talk to you. For my podcast listeners, where can they find you at? You can visit us. The best way to find us is on YouTube. Our okay. channel is called A Flash of Bigfoot. Okay. And, you know, our movies are on Amazon, uh, iTunes, Tubi, and you can always find us on Facebook under A Flash of Beauty Bigfoot Revealed. Excellent. Excellent. And I will put a link to your YouTube channel here in the credits of the show. It's been great to talk to you. I love how you can it's tell. Been it's been fun. Like, it's like, ah, makes my weird little heart happy, you know? I love these conversations because, um, you know, I'm that kind of, and I tell everybody, I'm. it's not that I believe every, but I always leave myself open because I think there's a lot of stuff out here that just because, how's this? You can't reproduce in a laboratory, which is what a lot of scientists want. They want you to be able to reproduce in a laboratory one. They want to, there's a lot out there that, that just can't be done, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Absolutely. And if I can, if, if I can just add one closing thought, sure. you know, the thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to make the paranormal normal. We need mm -hmm. to normalize these conversations and remove the stigma. So yes. people will share their experiences. We all have a piece of the puzzle. And by sharing our stories and our encounters, we can help other people cope and understand what they're trying to figure out as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, and I tell everybody, despite these last few years with the paranormal shows and everything have kind of like made it more mainstream, there's still a lot of stigma attached. People don't realize that that's why people sometimes are very keep back the stories of their experiences because they're like, nah, nah, I'm just not going to risk it being that person. Yeah. Again, thank you so much. And I want to wish you, are you working on, you said that you were working on something now? We are currently working on uh, the documentary based on Ron Moorhead's book, Voices okay. in the Wilderness, about the okay. Sierra sounds that they recorded up in uh, up in the up in the hills in uh, northern yes, California. Yes, God, I'm telling you, that is like. Phew. Again, thank you so much, and I want to wish you the best of luck in all your projects. Okay. Thank you so much. It's been this was really fun. <laughs> Absolutely, I'll be following you guys. Take care. Okay. Take care. See, you, you guys, like I said, I'm going to have a link to their YouTube channels because they, they, this is what I like, you know, they're, they have interviews with regular people, normies, if you want to call them. In other words, yes, they do interview people that are, if you want to call it into the, um, Bigfoot community, as far as researchers or like Ron Moorhead that he's got, he's been doing it for years and years, but they also interview people that for lack of a better word are living their lives and have encounters in other words they're not looking for it but see this is the an, uh, how's this i'm not gonna say that people that are out there trying to have a bigfoot encounter their sightings or whatever happens is not legit i'm not saying that but i think that when you come across somebody that for lack of a better word, stumbles across an experience because whether they're a hunter, uh, an outdoor, whatever, they're berry picking, I don't know, that they have this, those to me are like, for lack of the legit ones, the ones where I, I, this person's not primed to make something out of nothing. It's like, if you're out there looking for Bigfoot and it's like, oh, that, you know, it's like, wait, no, no. this is a person who's, they're doing something else. And then, things happen. As a matter of fact, it takes them even a minute to kind of like grasp the scenario, like what am I seeing or what am I hearing or what, what is that? That's like that nine foot, whatever that is. All right. Because your brain uh, does like a mental checklist of the possibilities, like as in normal possibilities until it gets to the, uh, no, it's not that, not that, not that, not that. So that means that what's that? And these are the, the, those interviews to, to me are the most fascinating ones. And like I said, sometimes people have that one experience in their lifetime. That's it. The one, you know, then there's other people that have more frequent ones, you know, especially let's say if they live in an area where let's say Bigfoot sightings are more frequent. So, you know, it just makes sense that they're going to 
And then there's people that it, it starts off that way. It starts off with a casual encounter and then they go seeking it or in some cases the the bigfoot or whatever comes to them that guy jim smith like i told you he passed away alabama bigfoot society he told me that at some because again he lived in some rural part of alabama and um he says he would go out he says that they had an area out in the woods he says it was like a, i guess it was a like a desiccated stump he says he would leave out there like sardines, you know, in a can like opened and stuff like that. And I remember when I asked him, I said, well, you know, Jim, how do you know it wasn't, the, you know, the million and one <laughs> animals out there that could have like, and he goes, because it would put the empty can right back on the stop. <laughs> like no animal that's going to eat this is going to take and put the can right back, like just empty back on the stump so he says that for years he was doing this thing of taking out like little i guess little food things here and there and he would just leave it there and one of the things though that one time we talked about he was telling me he says that there was this lady she lived by herself same thing uh very rural area and like basically you know once you know she had her immediate area around her house was cleared but then after that was just woods like wherever it goes he goes, and she started making these, she, she started doing that imitation calls that you hear about these, the supposedly the, the Bigfoot's doing. And she says she started um, doing these Bigfoot calls from the back porch. And he said that for a while, nothing happened. You know, one of those things, those experiments, but then she started getting calls. And then it was, you know, that, 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 what's that saying about be careful what you wish for? Because apparently from what he told if i remember correctly she had she had like um a couple of sheds like on the outer edge of her property that was cleared and um you know one of those light posts and all of a sudden she started seeing movement out there like and then the calls were coming closer and we were talking about like you know what sometimes people do these imitation sasquatch calls but do you really know what you're saying do you, do you, do you understand that for all, you know, you might be doing a mating call. <laughs> we were talking about that. Like that sometimes, I mean, I understand the idea is to encourage, um, what's the word contact or like, Hey, it's cool. Um, I sound just like you do, but that, that's, that's like, uh, when you go someplace and you don't know the language. And you, for all you know, you could be saying curse words or your mother's ugly or God knows. Same thing. What if you're, do and then after that, she started, uh, she was started, um, she started hearing thumping. Like, you know, like when you, something's along the, the side of your walls of your house. And, um, in other words, it came to the point, she stopped doing it. She stopped doing it because she says that she, first of all, she lived by herself out there. And second of all. I guess she really thought of it. You know, like when people think one thing is in theory and another thing is in practice, you know, like one of them was like, oh, I'm going to do the Bigfoot call and maybe Bigfoot will call back and then Kumbaya moment will happen. Uh, yeah. Except all of a sudden Bigfoot is stalking your yard and you hear it thumping along your walls at night. And what was it? I can't, I, there was something that I can't remember if it was that, uh, whether they, she, they, I, th I think if I remember correctly, at some point she found like, she had like this little patio furniture on the porch. And it was like, one time she comes out, it was like, Arr! you know, like the patio furniture was like twisted, like, Arr! and that was like the point where she said, uh, no more Bigfoot calls. None of, no more of that. Because as she started getting concerned, she started realizing, and she said also that she, I guess she, you know, she had poultry and things like that, and that all the <laughs> interestingly, all the animals, of course, are like they they were wigging out. She says she could hear her animals in the barn, and and I guess in the area where she kept them, like wigging out, like. And um, in other words, these animals understood this is dangerous. This is this is this is not the berry picking, uh, what was it? The uh, Harry Henderson kind of thing from the movies. 
this is a predator. And she says that after that, she stopped doing the calls. And then it took a while for it to fade away and stop. But yeah, it was one of these things where you, it's very admirable that you think, oh, I want to reach out to this, whatever it is, the whatever a Bigfoot is. But when you don't understand exactly what you're dealing with, you have to be really, really careful. All right. You have to be really careful. And, um, and I'm sure people that are familiar and have heard of different Bigfoot Sasquatch stories. There's times people that normally go out there to have encounters. There'll be times with everything is copacetic. It's wonderful. It's lovely. And they'll hear far off calls or knockings or whatever. And then there's times that there's something wrong. There's something going on. There's a thing like, this is not a good day to be here, a good night to be here. We need to get out of here. All right. There's, there's, there's people that will tell you that. No, there's, or they, they have felt because some, you'll have people say, well, I felt like my, you know, going along with the Bigfoot theory, you know, I was, I was being stared. I was being looked at, but it's a, it was like this thing of I'm being looked at versus I'm being looked at and I want to take your head off. All right. In other words, that there's a menace to it. As in, I got to, I got to get out of here because I'm on the short end of this stick, real short. And uh, this will come from people that are very experienced in the outdoors. They understand what are the animals out there, um, what's dangerous, what's not. Uh, and they've said, and they, 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 in other words, they couldn't say, I, this, this specifically, it was just the feeling, the, the, I think part, part of us that maybe we don't understand ourselves is telling your lizard brain, get out, you know, like from the way, get out. Yeah. Well, that kind of deal. And they'll tell you, and you know, when you follow your instinct is like, yeah, I, I'm not going to stay around to find out why my brain is telling me get out. So yeah, that, that thing with the pair, I, and I know there's people out there that it's like, oh, Bigfoot, he's so cuddly and nice and he's just misunderstood. I'm sorry. I think Bigfoot, mm, let's leave the interdimensional mystical aspect out of the equation. I think Bigfoot is an animal, maybe a very highly intelligent animal, but like all animals has its quirks. It's Maybe it's even its own distinct personality, depending on which one. Uh, I think that like animals, there's times that you have to be careful when you're around them as in when they have young, you'll, you'll, you'll hear from anybody that you want to be, you want to be an animal around an animal that's dangerous. It's when a mother is around its young, you know, when they're trying to protect their young, um, or just something about them that we don't understand because we really don't know about them. We don't, we don't know what their life cycle is like. We don't know. We, a lot of it is assumed. How's that? You know, what, what is their, um, what is it? Uh, again, like I was talking about made during, during mating season, it's like steer clear of everybody. All these, all these animals want to do, especially males is mate, you know, all they're looking for. And they see anything else that's as in a human, as, as stupid as it sounds as a competition, because at that point they're in the, this is their mating season. And they're, they're, maybe they come, the, the nature of their species is where males compete for that one female. All right. This is, this is something that's bred into them. That's part of their nature. So even if there's not another Bigfoot male next to them, they, that their brain is wired a certain way where, Hey, right now I'm looking for my female or I sent her and anything that is might come and take my female or my chance of reproducing, I'm going to knock its head off or I'm going to, I'm ready to challenge it. Cause that's, that's nature. Come on. You know what Dr. Malcolm from Jurassic Park said, life finds a way. And one of those life finds a way is competition among males, let's say to find viable females. In other words, that are, you know, let's say, let's say the dog thing in heat, you know, like most animals that there's a, just like a certain time. It, you know, if you look at nature, not all females will get pregnant 
at randomly they there's a window of time where maybe they go into Menach or into the heat where if you don't catch them then they're not first of all they're not going to deal with you they're going to fight you and they can't get pregnant all right so the males know hey that female that's putting off that scent and this is the time of year if i don't get to her you know it's over that could account for a lot of when you hear what she said about the 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 that they they charge or you could feel like hey you know that you're not being welcomed or it's not like that oh you know that um it's all good we're looking at you and observing you it's like you need to get out of here i've read a lot of bigfoot encounters that detail something along those lines all right i personally think that that's a that's usually a good reason territory mating young having the young or offspring around and or like i said if you have an animal that's hurt animals when they're hurt even when usually when animals are sick and dying they kind of go off somewhere and die you know like maybe they're old or just they're sick they're diseased they'll just let go somewhere but if they've been hurt <clears throat> especially if it's recent and they're hurting just like humans this is when you're at your worst it's like don't touch me don't look at me ah and i think that that sometimes might account for scenarios where people will have stories of aggressive bigfoots and let's not even go into the dog man thing that's like a whole different story but anyway guys i hope you like this interview with jill i think it's fascinating i like let me tell you something that work that she's doing with ron Moorhead that's got to be really interesting and um yes by all means visit her i'm gonna look up that thing that dark that dark matter monsters i gotta look that up because whether you want to look at the how can I say it? When it's dark matter or physics or anything as the ex the explanation for things we can't understand, you know, and all of a sudden everything's being dumped in the physics un or un misunderstood or unknown or not fully understood physics of our dimension as the real explanation for whatever. Eh, that's okay, but we can't also just put it all on, you know, physics as as being why we can't see certain things when they're in front of us or why let's say what she was talking about like in a port stuff like that or like like let's say when a hair sample disappears and then reappears mm, interesting let me tell you some very interesting times we live in so anyway guys don't forget to sign up for my newsletter go to mppellicer.com and from substack i'll send you a newsletter about maybe once couple of times a week if that much depends if i can get around to it i do articles i'll i put stuff on my archive old interviews or podcast versions of the shows uh things of that nature go to miami ghost chronicles.com mppelvester.com again i'm on all the major podcast platforms across the board spotify i'm in apple Stories of the Supernatural, Nightshade Diaries, Supernatural Storytime, Eerie.News, um, iHeartRadio, you name it. You can find me also besides YouTube. I'm on Rumble. I'm on BitChute. I'm on uh, CloudHub, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Until next time, guys, take care. You are all wonderful. And again, I've got some great guests coming on. I think you're really going to enjoy. Till then.